the sound, which I think is back up now. There we are. Hi. Um, <laughs> we haven't found anything spectacular at this stage of the game. But what we have found is a vista, the likes of which will probably bring tears to, it, uh, to your eyes. And if it doesn't, you can be fairly sure that your heart is not as large as it should be. Look at that. A great grey cloud rolling in from the southwest. Endless space. The escarpment of the great rift valley there, just below the sun that you can see there. Just the oddly placed tree where under which we've been looking, each one. Graham has been forcing me to peer until my eyes are sore looking for lions. We're trying to find lions because we're going to see if we can uh, maybe follow them tonight. And it is a little difficult, but I am failing to find any disadvantage in not finding lions because this is the kind of thing we've been looking at all day long. And as the sun begins to set, you can just see how the colors have become an astonishing, astonishing sort of well, I don't really know. I guess everything's turned to honey, basically. The grass is honey-coloured. This is that red oat grass. Much of it, what we call Thamida triandra, or red grass in South Africa. Each of those trees, there's some boskia trees or shepherd's bushes. There are a couple of acacias. And a huge grey cloud coming in from the southwest, which may or may not bring rain. We're not sure. But what we did find on the first day was when you were driving around here, um, what happened was that every time that you found a bubble uh, where there weren't wildebeest, there was normally something else there. Uh, we found lions in one of those bubbles, and that's what we're trying to do here. Now, Tim, on the subject of these sparsely arranged trees, you say, why are they so sparsely arranged? Tim, I don't know exactly, but my guess is that this is a, well, it's, it's a, what they used to term a climax grassland, which means that it's been rendered this way by fire. It's got a very particular soil type that's very good for the development of this grass. But I think mostly what you'll find is that these numbers of wildebeest, these huge numbers of animals that come through this area, have kept the seedlings down. The grazing of this kind of grass stimulates its growth. And I think that's why the bush has been kept in check, largely, by the numbers of animals. I think were you to remove the animals from this area, I think you'd find that the bush would take over, probably maybe not too quickly, but it would certainly get a lot thicker. And the soil type here is sort of, well, I don't know exactly what its derivation is, but it will get very inundated. It's quite clay, it's got quite good nutrients in it, and it gets very inundated with water during the rainy season. Is that not just the most beautiful thing? There is a vulture. Now, you know what? Hello, Tony. You say you haven't teared up, but you do think it's amazing. Tony, that's all right. I think your heart is big then. Now, for those of you who are keeping a bird list of safari live birds, that could be a new one. I think that could well be, I can't see exactly from here, but it does look like a Rupel's vulture. We have seen many Rupel's vulture while we've been here. Looks very much like a, looks very much like a, a white-backed vulture. And that's what I think that one is. Now, I just want to see, yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's what that one is. Now. What else? Oh, we did. Also, the other thing that we had to show you here was a jackal, and it was a side striped jackal, and it seems to have disappeared. Apparently, it has a den in this region. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a jackal pup, but it is an extremely cute thing to see. What have you got there, Graham? Where's that carcass of it? Ah, there's a carcass. There we are. Graham has found a carcass, everybody. Um, no, that I think is a tussock. Let's go, go, there we are, there it is there. Well done, Graham, that's it there. Now, Graham, of course, is convinced that that was murdered by lions. I think it might have been, but what's interesting is that it hasn't been finished. So, even if it was killed by lions, what's fascinating is that 
it's been left. There are, there's lots of meat left on that thing. There are no hyenas here. There are no lions here. I think the necessity to eat, well, there could be lions here. Sorry, the cameraman just gave me a nasty glare. Um, they, <laughs> they don't have the necessity to eat rotting flesh here because there is so much fresh stuff in the offing. And I think many of these animals die of natural causes. Now, Zoe, you had a nice question. I think about when the animals move away from these clearings. Is that right, Lou? Not, not getting it. Uh, okay, right. Zoe, <laughs> when it's summer. Um, right, Zoe, we're very, very close to the equator here. So the seasons are almost the same all the year round. So in theory we're in winter because we're just south of the equator, probably about 200 kilometers or so. That's about 120 miles. And yes, it is uh, in summertime, so I guess that would be any time during the summer when we have summer down in the south there. Yes, they aren't here. I'm not sure it's so much seasonal. They do tend to follow the rains, uh, but I'm not sure it would be to do with hot and cold. Certainly there is a seasonality about the growth of the grass here and about the rains and when they fall. Um, and that's what they move around for. But I mean, we're in, in theory in winter here. I think you'll find that the mean temperature here is very much uh, less widely, uh, there's a much less wide deviation from cold to hot than there would be down where we are in the Kruger, where it goes from say four degrees or uh, 40 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up in summer to 45 degrees Celsius, which is about 109 or so degrees Fahrenheit. Here I think you'll find that range is much smaller. Hello, Aaron. You say the Rupel's Vulture takes your list to 104. That's great news. Graham wants to know where the jackal's gone. Um, Graham, I can't find it, to be honest. It's not very difficult for a jackal to hide in these parts. Of course, the... Brent was here, he'd find it. Uh, Graham just saying there, if Brent was here, he would find it. Yes, I'm sure he would, Graham. He is, he is six foot four, of course, which means that he would have concussed himself several times on the roof of this Land Rover, Land Cruiser. You see what I have to work with, everybody? This is the kind of nonsense I have to deal with on a daily basis. Sorry, James, Richard, I missed your question there. I'm going to have to ask for it again. Ah, you want to know if I've seen any new species of hornbill? I haven't, actually. I saw one fly over. I heard a trumpet to hornbill yesterday, but actually I haven't seen much in the way of hornbills at all. So, no, nothing new in the hornbill range at this stage. Right, I think we're probably going to have, ooh, just look, just look under the sun there, Graham. The hyena research vehicle has stopped. Now, this is our, you have to find animals here, of course, because you can't track, A, because it's Im totally impossible to track. Um, it's totally impossible to track animals across the grass there, right there, that little speck there in the middle of the screen. There you are. And what happens is you can't also walk. You're not allowed to walk here. So it's very much a case of scanning the clearings and looking where the other activity is. All right, everybody, that's a brief segment from us here in Kenya. Astounding that we're able to be here and really just views that will bring tears to your eyes and make your heart swell and be happy to be alive. Let's head back across to Sandila, who is also happy to be alive and disease-free. <laughs>